As with her mother and her aunt, her connection with Victoria College would last throughout her life. Particularly for their time, the women in Mary's family were highly educated. Newton's sister, Mary Rowell, was the first female professor at Victoria College. During Nell's student days in the late 1890s, the college had 226 students and 14 of them were women. If I just say the term Victoria College, what does that conjure up for you? The old song, my father sent me to Victoria and resolved that I should be a man. <laughs> <laughs> and we sang it. Had no sense of the sexism involved in it at all. I have been told to write from the girl's viewpoint. I don't see much point in it because surely we are not so very different from the men. Of course, I suppose we do see some things in a different light. Nevertheless, this history is written for the sake of the men. God bless them just to let them see how we felt when we were freshmen. I must admit, I think we felt human. Here, Mary joined the student Christian movement. This ecumenical campus organization was radical in its commitment to social and political transformation. The SCM has found its true vocation is poisoning the student mind. And they talked about building the city of God and about making Canada the green and pleasant land, which was out of that old hymn about Jerusalem, that we will build Jerusalem um, to create the kingdom of God on earth. They saw themselves as Christian socialists. They went even so far as to have sessions around Christianity and Marxism. People got really nervous about that, especially in the institutional church. A lot of them called the, the SCMers troublemakers, but assumed that because they were young, they'd grow out of it. And of course, we never did. <laughs> Mary's lifelong commitment to building the kingdom of God on earth had its roots in her parents' Methodist beliefs. Though she lived each day in an affluent and privileged setting, Mary responded passionately to the needs and issues of people who had none of what she enjoyed. There are a good many families of their breed who, <coughs> who really cared about the, the people around them and, and, and created a country that we feel proud of with ethics. There was always the feeling that although we had to do our work in this country, mm -hmm. that we were part of a whole world that we needed to feel connected to. There was more equality between men and women in the SCM than almost anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so women in the SCM found uh, a place for their exercising their leadership. Mary's leadership abilities were highly valued and she had devoted friends. Inwardly though, she was struggling. Dearest mother, sometime we must have a talk together because I would like to have your help. At present I look into a blank. I have got to the stage where I think about nothing but myself and it isn't a very pleasant subject. I worry so much about not being able to talk and having no friends. You don't know half the rottenness of your daughter. And I always know people line me up beside you and say, not half so good as her mother. That is the worst of having such a lovely, perfect and wonderful mother. And there is no use of me trying to be like you. Mary longed to find her place in a world that offered conflicting messages to young women. Popular women's magazines acknowledged their readers' hopes by featuring the girl of the new age, the flapper. But in this post-war period, people also clung to traditional values. For women in her social class, marriage was the most acceptable occupation. 
Mary was not ready to take on the commitment of marriage and family just yet. She clearly had more of her own life and the world to explore. In 1925, Mary received her degree in language and ethics. As a graduation gift, she accompanied her father on a three-month tour of the Pacific countries. On board ship, Mary met a young Anglican priest, Roy Lee, who was sailing home to Australia. This encounter marked the beginning of a relationship that would lead Mary to one of the most regretful decisions of her life. On that voyage, Mary experimented with independent behaviors which appalled her father. Had my first real fag today. Mrs. Rothman very kindly bobbed my hair. It was a splendid feeling to have it off at last. Home again, she wrestled with the ongoing problem, what to do with the rest of her life. At this point, Mary seems to enter a period of struggle for separation and independence from the safety and security of her home family. The clear and pronounced values and expectations of her family, her community, the church, the university, are now to be tested and perhaps replaced by beliefs and experiences that are more clearly her own. Mary drafted a plan. She'd go to Selly Oak, a Y leadership training center in England. She'd audit courses at the London School of Economics. She'd study French in Paris and she'd represent Canada at international Christian student gatherings. In England, she shared her views about Canada's independent role in international affairs. Mary's growing nationalism was a foundation for these commitments throughout her life. There appears to be a commonly accepted opinion that Canada and the United States are in sympathy with each other and that Canada is influenced by the States to the extent that she adopts the same policies. This is hardly the case. On the contrary, Canada takes this quite independent line of thought. Mary's own road to independence had more bumps in it than she had anticipated. Miss Kelman is a bit too severe and strict for me. I'll have to tone myself down to her. I'll certainly know more about the Bible when I leave. Yours as ever, the good old hard-working, plodding Mary. P.S. Everyone here seems very clever. What hope for me? Mary struggled not only with a crisis of confidence, but also with a crisis of faith. As her distress deepened, a Sally Oak mentor suggested that she see prominent British psychoanalyst J.A. Hatfield. Psychoanalysis was at this time in its infancy and considered quite avant-garde. Her father, while willing to pay the bills for her daily sessions, asked, what is a psychoanalyst? Buoyed by her mother's encouragement and support for her analysis, Mary confided in Nell. We are working on my mother complex now. My incapacity to express my love and emotional feelings is the gist of the repression. I don't know how this will work out. As Mary explored her inner life, her outer world began to open up. During her travels, Mary met international delegates at conferences of the World Student Christian Federation. Her days were packed with prayers and presentations. But finally, she got to enjoy the pleasures that she had been longing for. Three nights there were entertainments that went on long after midnight. I have even sunk to the place of having to wear undarned stockings. I have loved it all. In my heart of hearts, I think I came for a good time. And here I was going to let out. So I have, in my harmless way, and at present there are no regrets. 
After the trauma of World War I, Paris in the 20s was the heartbeat of Europe. Picasso and Gertrude Stein, Joyce, Stravinsky. In the midst of this creative ferment, Mary savored as much as she could. Dance the Charleston all night long. It's heaps of fun having the men kiss your hands. They do it after a dance. One feels quite like a queen. Douglas Duncan invited me to the bourgeois gentilhomme at the Comédie Française. Tout le monde va au théâtre le dimanche ici. Please don't think I've gone to the dogs or anything, because I haven't. I'm still big on religious ideas. Mary's most ardent admirer was Roy Lee, the brilliant Anglican priest and Oxford scholar that she had met the year before. Though he later became a highly respected theologian and Freudian psychologist, Roy was then working in Paris for the International Student Service. He fell deeply in love with the young woman he called Marigold. My Marigold, I want to see you in your blue hat that matches your eyes. I want to see your face come to life from the land of reverie. I want to adore your beautiful head rising out of your fur. In fact, I just want Mary. Ever your Roy. Mary wrote to her parents. I had dinner with Roy Lee at a Chinese restaurant. It was a bit hard on Roy. He is half Chinese, but considers himself altogether Australian. In such an atmosphere, he is taken for Chinese, and that must hurt sometimes. I was sorry I asked him to take me there. As Mary's year abroad was ending, she received a job offer to become the women's secretary for the student Christian movement in Toronto. Her salary would be $1,500 a year, and she offered to return a portion of it. While Mary made plans to leave Paris, Roy reached out again. My Marigold, I saw from the beginning that you did not love me, Avec Amour, but only with a very tender amitié. I wanted to protect you from all the fear and harm that I could, and if anyone ever hurts you, I shall never be able to forgive them. My dear, the man who marries you will be happy beyond words. I would give anything to be he. Your Roy. Left Paris for London. Roy came and saw me off. It was sad to part, but wise. Though Mary rejected Roy's love, she kept his letters for the rest of her life. Dear Mother, I can't tell you how much I hated saying goodbye to everyone and to England. It seemed like the end of everything, my youth into the bargain. I have to return to responsibilities which I don't know that I welcome as yet. It certainly is the end of one phase of my life and I am very happy to have had it. Every moment was wonderful. <laughs> 